This episode is brought to you by my fertility awareness programs. Master fertility awareness and improve your menstrual cycle health at the same time. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me for more information. That's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 162. Welcome to the 162nd episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm really excited to share today's interview with you. Today's guest is actually has been on the show before. So today's guest, Katie Singer, I interviewed her back in episode number 33. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with Katie Singer, Katie Singer wrote the book, The Garden of Fertility and a huge contribution to the fertility awareness world. So, uh, you know, the majority of my listeners are more familiar with Tony Weschler's Taking Charge of Your Fertility, but Katie Singer's Garden of Fertility is also an incredible resource. So for those of you who may be new to the method, it's worth checking out and also taking a listen to the interview that we did back in episode 33. If you haven't listened to it, it's a really interesting interview. It's really interesting to be able to talk to Katie. But what's interesting is that her focus has shifted We talked about it a little bit in our first interview together, but one of the areas that Katie's really working on now is actually electromagnetic radiation. In today's interview, we really focus on the topic of electromagnetic radiation. I always joke that after those types of conversations, I just get really freaked out. Like (laughs) I'm looking around, I'm getting suspicious of my Wi-Fi, and it's it's hard as a you know as a woman in So at the time of recording, it's 2017. There's so many devices in my house and many of them have no cords. So that means that there's just a ton of radiation. And I live in a townhouse, as I've said before, which means I'm literally connected to people around me. And if I ever just turn on my laptop and look at the Wi-Fi, there's eight to 10 different (laughs) possibilities for me to join that I obviously can't join because they're locked. But you get my point. There's just tons of waves going around. So in today's interview, you know, we talk a little bit about that and what you need to know and what you can actually do reasonably to reduce your exposure in a way that doesn't leave you feeling totally overwhelmed and just bummed out at the fact that it's kind of scary. It's always scary when you talk about electromagnetic radiation. (laughs) And for those of you who are looking for more information about fertility awareness charting, I want to invite you to check out my work with me page. So I have a number of programs that I offer. If you are either just learning to chart, really wanting to make that transition from hormonal birth control to an effective non-hormonal method. For a lot of women who discover this podcast, this is the first time that they've really had extensive information on the the fact that you can actually pay attention to your cycles, pay attention to your cervical mucus, and use that method effectively as a way to prevent pregnancy without any type of hormonal contraceptives. So I have a number of clients who are looking for a bit of support during that phase of transition so that they can be really confident in their use of this method as their primary method of birth control. And I also have a number of clients who I support who are in the process, whether they've been actively trying to conceive for a while or whether they're planning to conceive in the future, but really wanting to get a sense of what information they can gather from their cycles and how you can really use your cycle as in many ways a diagnostic tool so that you can identify potentially some of those underlying issues that otherwise wouldn't be coming out if you weren't charting. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me for more information. And if you do have questions about the different programs and which program would be a better fit, uh, you can actually sign up for a 15 minute consultation with me and we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. And so without further ado, let's jump into today's interview with Katie Singer. And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest Katie Singer back to the show. I was so excited the first time I reached out to Katie and she actually said yes to come on the show and talk about her book, The Garden of Fertility. And so you may know Katie from the work that she's done in the fertility awareness world. So in addition to authoring the book, Garden of Fertility, she's also the author of Honoring Our Cycles and Honoring Our Cycles in Africa. And those books are amazing resources uh, in terms of fertility awareness, and not just the method itself, but also the intersection between fertility awareness knowledge and your overall health. But in Katie Singer's most recent book, An Electronic Silent Spring, she focuses more on the impact of long-term exposure to electromagnetic radiation. 
And so in our last interview, we talked a lot about the menstrual cycle and the impact of light and dark on the cycle. And that was a really interesting uh, and informative interview. So I would encourage you to head back over to episode number 33 if you haven't had a chance to listen. Uh, But one of the other topics that we talked about in the show was exposure to electromagnetic radiation and the implications during pregnancy and when you have small children. And I know recently a few of you, a few of my listeners have reached out to me regarding that as well and, you know, what to do. And so that is the topic that we're going to be tackling a little bit more in today's show. And so without further ado, welcome back to the show, Katie. Hi, Lisa. I am really glad to be here. Thank you for having me again. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank you for coming back on the show. And I guess to start, the listeners can always go back to our previous episode and hear, you know, a little bit about you and your story. But for today's episode, I just wanted to talk specifically to start off. How did you first enter into this kind of world of electromagnetic radiation and raising awareness? Like, what was it that drove you to this area in particular? Sure. I learned, so I'm in the United States. and. I learned the Telecommunications Act of 1996, specifically Section 704 in the United States Telecom Act states that no health or environmental concern can interfere with the placement of a cell tower. (laughs) Yeah. You're in Canada, right? Yeah, I'm in Canada. So Canada has basically similar federal laws. Almost all countries that I'm aware of have similar laws. And when I learned that, I was just shocked. I went into denial for a while, and that didn't change anything. Um, The law is still there. So I just was moved to find out more. Well, and I know for the listeners, if this is kind of the first time you're kind of broaching that this topic of electromagnetic radiation, I would encourage you to listen to episode 33 as well, because for the, about the second half or the last kind of, uh, you know, one third of that interview, that's where we really delved into electromagnetic radiation. And so, Katie, before the show, we were having a little pre-chat. And of course, I, I guess one of the things that I joke about with my clients, and I'm not sure if I've said it on the show before, is that after our interview <laughs> back then, I was actually a lunatic for at least three to four weeks afterwards. And what I mean by that was that I was really just nervous about the electromagnetic radiation in my house. It was on my mind a lot. And I remember having conversations with my husband and we were shutting off the Wi-Fi. And I, I would joke that it took me a little while to get back to normal because when you talk about this topic and I have uh, two little kids, <laughs> a one-year-old and a four-year-old, it's so scary because it seems like just such a big topic. I mean, my husband has two cell phones, sometimes three because of his work. <laughs> and I have one. And we live beside a cell tower. And so, I mean, that's just to get our feet wet and just to kind of orient the audience to how big of a topic this is. I guess to get us started then into this topic, maybe you could tell us a little bit about this kind of delicate balance that we are in, in terms of our dependence on technology, uh, the fact that it's not going anywhere, but also our body's limitations and kind of how do we manage the biological aspects of our body, the fact that this exposure to all this radiation can be harmful to us, but we also depend on this technology in order to live and do our work and all those types of things. Well, I want to answer that question, but before I do, I really want to salute you and the listeners today because facing this, it is lunatic making. It's really scary. I'm scared a lot of the time. And I'm confused a lot of the time. I don't have answers a lot of the time. And yet not facing what's going on doesn't work for me either. If you have small children or you're wanting to conceive at this time on planet Earth, I mean, any of those things, there are so many things going on. So I will say what comforts me personally is being able to talk about this with other people and say, okay, this is really scary, but let's try and just take a little step into the water and look at a little bit of it. And then maybe another day, we'll look at a little bit more. So I just want to sincerely salute you for having me on the show and for taking a look. Well, thank you. Because yeah, it's not an easy conversation to have. So I mean, you brought up just 
why this is important for women who are planning to conceive. So give us a, a refresher and orient us to yeah. why is electromagnetic radiation a problem and maybe what is it? So take us back to the very, very basics. Yeah. Like what is it? Why is it a problem? And why is it worse for babies and children? So here I want to start actually with one of the first things that I learned when I was really delving deeply into fertility awareness. I learned that life evolves from two processes, heating and cooling and drying and moistening. So like dandelions and rain and menstrual cycles, everything evolves from those processes, heating and cooling, drying and moistening. And women can observe that. And meteorologists, women can observe those cycles in their menstrual cycles by charting the temperature and the mucus, for example. Meteorologists can observe patterns of heating and cooling and drying and moistening by looking at weather patterns. When I started learning about digital technologies, then I learned that I went back billions of years ago. Um, my teacher actually is a geophysicist who's also got two degrees in electrical engineering. And I learned from him that billions of years ago, this planet was a mass of water, dust, rock, and gases. And then lightning began to strike. It was actually a bombardment of lightning storms. And out of that came amino acids and enzymes, like the, the beginning blocks of life. And little plants arrived and we had life. <laughs> and it evolved over billions of years because of this electromagnetic energy. And it continues, life continues to function by natural electromagnetic energy. So my voice right now is functioning by electrochemical signals, you know, from my brain to the vocal cords and all that stuff. Each of us knows how to locate home and how to digest food how to nurse a baby, all of those things are from electrochemical signals that every cell in our body functions by. So in other words, we need these cues from the Earth's electromagnetic energy in order to function. Now I'm going to fast forward about 200 years ago. And at that time, people figured out how to generate, store, and transmit electrical energy. This was man-made electrical energy. So around 1880 or so, we started laying out an electric grid and lights, and we got refrigerators and vacuum cleaners and radios and televisions. And here we are 135 years later, and we live in an environment that is nearly saturated with man-made electromagnetic energy. So I'm beginning to experience it as living in two worlds. In one world, my allegiance is completely to biology and to nature and to my ancestors and to, you know, the great mystery of being alive now. And then in my other world, I'm totally loyal to the electric company that provides electricity so that I can have a refrigerator and I don't know how to function without a telephone or a refrigerator or a radio. <laughs> I really like having a hot water heater, all of those things. So I don't know how to function without these man-made conveniences and appliances. So there it is. I have loyalty to both worlds. Well, I'll say, you know, none of us has been educated for knowing how to balance these two worlds. Well, and when you look up information around electromagnetic radiation and the impact that it can have on, say, growing fetus or uh, your young children, generally, you know, the, the way that it goes is that obviously children and babies are more vulnerable, their skulls are thinner, their, you know, their bodies are still forming, and therefore, you know, exposure to electromagnetic radiation can have a variety of different impacts on their development, and it can be associated with behavioral disorders and all different types of things. One theme that t seems to run through these discussions is that 
there's no real way to specifically identify it. So there's no way to say, or is there? Maybe you can correct me. But it would seem kind of a more elusive because it's not like they're there's ingesting no, you... something and they're getting a rash. Like <laughs> you're exposed to this electromagnetic radiation. Yeah. But then, you know, like and you say your child has a behavioral problem. Well, how do you know that that is specifically attributable to the electromagnetic ra- radiation exposure? Or how do you know that it's not because they had a bad day? Like, <laughs> how how do you figure out this out? Like, how do we do? Yeah. How do we figure out what the real impact is? Like, to what extent it's really like to what extent we really need to be afraid? Okay, so let me try unpacking that. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so in order for a cell phone or a cell tower to operate or a baby monitor, a wireless baby monitor, in order for those things to function, they're going to emit electromagnetic radiation. That's just how it works. If you're on a wireless phone, in order for it to receive the data, the signals from the person you're talking with, it's got to communicate with the nearest cell tower. But there's no wire containing that electromagnetic energy. So it's there, but it's invisible. And it's going to penetrate buildings and trees and people. Does that make sense that it's invisible energy, but it is there in order to function, Yeah. in order for the, the device to function? Now, I can explain how my United States Federal Communications Commission determined that cell phones are safe, and that's based on thermal effects. Basically, they gave a 220-pound plastic model. They filled this dummy's head with salty fluid. And then they gave, they took his temperature. Here's the heating and cooling and moistening and drying thing again. They took this plastic dummy's temperature and then they gave him a cell phone for six minutes. This was in the mid nineties. And then after those six minutes, they took his temperature again. And because it had, the temperature had not changed by two degrees Celsius in those six minutes, cell phones are safe. So That means that my government, FCC, looks only at the thermal effects of exposure to cell phones. That's the only way that it has tested to see, is there a problem here? And there was no problem after those few minutes. There are thousands of other studies that show non-thermal effects. You mentioned some of them, like behavioral problems. Usually, we don't see those problems immediately. They can take a long time to show up. It could be a few years. uh, It could be a few months. It could be a decade. And I would say, mm, like if we look at the effects of cigarette smoke or pesticide exposure, mold In those cases, people may notice something quickly, like even with secondhand smoke, you'll say, ugh, disgusting. Although I have to say, when I was growing up and both of my parents smoked, I really didn't like it, but I didn't associate health problems with that smoke until much later. And my parents smoked through my pregnancy as well. Uh, You know, when I was, not when I was pregnant, but when I was in my mother's womb. So I had in utero cigarette smoke exposure as well. And we now know that that can cause health problems. My parents didn't know it. I don't know if they would have been able to quit their cigarettes if they had known or whatever. But the radiation emitted by digital technologies is invisible to us. And then the effects are usually not immediate. So you can't know. To answer your question, you can look at studies, and we do have lots of studies that show a lot of problems. And so I'm going to come from this precautionary way and say, okay, so what can I do in a reasonable way to reduce my exposure? What's possible? 
it's interesting because as a mom of two young kids who has a cell phone and Wi-Fi in the house, and it's the reality of our lives. And to be honest, I don't have any friends that don't have Wi-Fi in their house. So, and a lot of my friends have kids too. And all of my friends have cell phones. I actually recently found out that I actually have one friend that doesn't have a cell phone and that my parents don't have a cell phone. But literally everybody else I know other than that one friend and my parents have cell phones. And some of them have more than one cell phone. Cell phone, as I mentioned, my husband has two or three sometimes. And in the reality of my day-to-day life and while I was pregnant, I still had a cell phone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I use it. I call people. And when I go to the park or when I go out um, and I see pregnant women or women with children, their children at the park, they also have cell phones. I guess where I'm going with this is so it's, it's really hard then because this is kind of intangible. We are beginning to learn about the risks and to know and to understand, but I have no way to know like what to do. So is it that I can't have a cell phone in the house? Is it, I mean, I don't let my kids, for instance, like play with my cell phone. Like I don't let them hold it. And whenever I'm talking to somebody on it, you know, say I would put it on a speaker phone or, but at the end of the day, like, I don't know whether the phone has to be a meter away or whether it has to be a mile away. Like I I have, this is so intangible. So as a woman, as a mother, it's just too vague for me. Like, I don't know I, I'm left to what just to do. exactly. And then also, like, like I said, like everybody else that I know is in the same position. So I wonder yeah. if in the future, it might this kind of conversation might move from how to prevent it, because how do you prevent it? Versus it's kind of like the piece, how do you prevent? How do you prevent what? How do you prevent your exposure or minimize it? Okay, because I kind of relate it to like, I live in a big city. So when I go outside, I'm going to breathe yeah. the smoke. So I've had to make peace with that. Like, I can't stress about that every day. I can't stress about the fact that I live in a big city and there's lots of cars and smog or else, like, I, I have to release that. Let me come in here. Yeah. And I'm nearly finished with a paper. It's called Inviting Discussion About Safer Tech Use in Schools. If people go to my website, which is electronic silent spring.com. If you sign up on the newsletter, when I'm finished with this paper, you'll get word of it. And there are a lot of other resources on the website. And I'm going to talk about a lot of them right now in response to this question, what can you do? The first thing for me, you're already doing. And that is asking a question. And it's just like, okay, what can I do to reduce my exposure? You're starting out with that question. And that's the first ticket. Like we have that now in terms of like, well, what can I do to eat more healthy food during, you know, during pregnancy? Like, is there something I need to cut out? Is there something I need to increase? Like, that's just a really common question. And people know to ask questions around say, food and alcohol and other things when they're pregnant, when their babies are born. This is another question we need to ask. And it is intense. And we can do it. We're just going to say, okay, what's doable? So, um, and I would say one of the things, is there a way to do this activity without electronics? That's a fun thing. In terms of exposing your children, one basic rule is no digital devices until your child has reading, writing, and math skills mastered on paper. I think that's a a basic rule. No digital electronics until reading, writing, and math are mastered on paper. But you know that that some of the women listening have children already. And children from the age of two and three and four and five are on iPads and cell phones. Yeah. So then for the listener who kind of lets their kid play on their iPad sometimes, who's two and clearly is not at the reading and writing level, how are they supposed to take that? (laughs) Yeah, this is going to be hard. I would say one thing you can do is if you have already done that, I'm going to invite the possibility that you transition away, which is kind of like taking candy away after you've offered it. In order to do that, you're going to need to bring books in (laughs) 
And when the child is with the iPad, you don't want your child alone then. You want to treat the iPad like a book. It's still an activity that you do together. You don't want to use the iPad as a babysitter. And this is now also dealing with what's called screen time exposure. The radiation emitted by the devices, that's one problem from using digital technologies. And then just the screen time exposure is another problem. There's a child psychiatrist named Victoria Dunkley, and she has a fabulous book and website called Reset Your Child's Brain. And she had all these young children and teenagers coming to her with autism and psychotic behavior and the whole gamut, lots of meltdowns. And she tried this. She said, go on a three-week electronic fast. No electronics for three weeks. And the parents were like, we can't do that. There's no way we can't do that. And then she said, well, do you want another meltdown? And they were like, okay, all right, we'll try it. And after three weeks, in many cases, psychotic behavior and autism sometimes cleared up 100%. And then she would say, okay, let's now reintroduce the iPad or whatever it is. And you start with like 15 minutes in a day. And hmm, there, you, you have 15 minutes in the day and there's no problem. Great. The next day you go to maybe 25 minutes and there's still no problem. Great. And then the next day you try 40 minutes and the kid has a meltdown. Well, then, you know, you go back to 25 minutes a day. So you're learning what's the threshold for this child. But in order to get to knowing what the threshold is, you need the three-week fast. And she goes through describing how you can do this on her website and in her book, ResetYourChildsBrain.com. And her name again is? Victoria Dunkley, D-U-N-C-K-L-E-Y. That's funny, um, Katie, because it sounds like uh, it's, it sounds like an elimination diet, like what you would do with food to see if you yeah. have sensitivity. <laughs> yeah, and there are well, and there's another book by a New York psychologist, Nicholas Carderis, K A R D A R I S. His book is called Glow Kids, G L O W, Glow Kids, and he's been working in addiction for I don't know a couple of decades. And he said that treating tech addiction is more challenging than treating heroin or meth addiction. And so, yes, I am concerned that children, including toddlers, are using this stuff. And I have seen children have meltdowns when they can't have more screen time. Well, children it's, will have a meltdown for anything, in all fairness. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's, um, that's true, too. They'll have yes. a meltdown because it's um, Tuesday. And you're like, no. They're like, no, it's Wednesday, mommy. No, sweetheart, it's Tuesday. <laughs> ah. That's fair. Okay. Um, and I'll say when it's around technology, being able to use it, there's one recipe. I did a report called Calming Behavior in children with autism and ADHD. And that's also on my website, electroniccsilentspring.com. What I did in Calming Behavior was report on the work of a pediatrician in the Bay Area. She also had tons of children showing up in her office with autism. And she came up with this protocol. Turn the Wi-Fi off for at least 12 hours. Don't let the child near anything mobile, like a cordless phone or a cell phone or an iPad. Keep the child at least eight feet from any mobile device. And then if you can do it safely, unplug everything in the bedroom and turn the electricity off from the breaker box to the bedroom while your child is sleeping. And she also has seen miracle changes in children after two weeks of following those protocols. And I would say the beauty is those will dovetail with the electronic fast. They're different, but they complement each other. If you reduce the screen time exposure and you reduce the electromagnetic radiation exposure, again, that's calming behavior in children with autism and ADHD. But I was going to say something else that I've learned from Dr. Dunkley, and 
this really surprised me. Interactive screen time is more hazardous to brain development than passive screen time. If your kid is just watching a TV, that's passive. That is not great for the brain, but it's not nearly as bad as interactive screen where they're working a mouse or a pad or they're interacting with a video game. Somehow the brain does not do well when it's interacting with a screen. And yeah, kids can be really good at it, but then they lose some right brain, left brain integration that they need as they're developing. So Dr. Dunkley really cautions about that. But that, what is um, what does that mean? So how does that, like, so they, they interact with it, and then what if effect does that have on them later on? Well, that can be immediate, too, that you can get really aggressive behavior, you can get depression, you can get addiction, you can get, I would say, distortion of priorities, those kinds of things. And, you know, like I know those headlines, but the truth is I'm not, um, it's not, I'm not expert in that. You're going to have to go to her website for that, which is resetyourchildsbrain.com. Another person who has written about problems with screen time and her take is to balance the screen time with non-electronic activities. This is a Canadian woman. Her name is Chris Rowan, C-R-I-S, and her website is zonein.ca. That's Z-O-N-E hyphen I-N. Dot CA. And she does workshops in schools encouraging balancing screen time with, you know, gardening and playing sports and um, doing a puppet show and um, making pottery with clay. Those kinds of things which children really need. Well, and can I and, ask, is that more about um, just the well-being of the child versus the electromagnetic portion of it? Because I, there's different factors at play. I mean, there's socialization factors, kind of learning factors. And I mean, obviously, there's a difference between sitting down and reading a book with your child or doing an activity versus letting them play on a screen. But uh, is that related to the damage that's going to be done to your child physically from being exposed to the screen? Or is that more of the kind of interaction that the child might be missing out on if they're not doing something with their parent or somebody else? It's all of the above. And you are exactly right to notice that. And I'm looking now in this report that I'm going to be publishing on inviting discussion about all this. And Chris Rowan has pointed out that, okay, if you're just at a screen, then that's sedentary. I mean, you're not, the child isn't moving. And that leads to obesity, diabetes, developmental delays, illiteracy, learning difficulties. If you're just at a screen, that's really isolating. And that can lead to mental illnesses, including ADHD, autism, and depression. But just and, let me just throw something in there. It's because I'm a mom of two little kids. So it's like on behalf of the moms who are like busy and tired, sometimes when you get home from work and you have two or three kids, uh, some moms listening may have four or five, and you need to put some food on the table. I mean, <laughs> I think we have to like... I hear you. And I would say TV would be better than a video game. That's one simple thing. TV is not like a just a show where there's you're just passively watching it. That is better than a video game. Well, and so for the kind of tangible, so a lot of women listening are trying, are planning to conceive in the future, or maybe they're actively trying to conceive. Now, what I find challenging about a conversation about electromagnetic radiation is that it just leaves me feeling bad all the time because I'm not getting rid of my cell phone. Like I'm not, I'm actually not going to disconnect it. I'm not going to give it back to Apple. <laughs> I'm not going to stop using it. It's a part of my business. It's part of my life. And I do things. I mean, I, I don't put it to my head. I have like a cord that I plug into it when I'm speaking to somebody. 
So, I mean, I, I do things and I don't sleep beside it. I know that might some of the listeners may still do that if they don't shut it off or they don't put it in a different room. So, I mean, I don't sleep beside my phone. But, I mean, this is the challenge. So, for women then when they're getting pregnant, what are some guidelines that are practical that would actually, to put it out there, my three-year-old son who's turning four shortly is in uh, kindergarten, like the, the kind of pre some in some places it'd be called preschool, but this is like the first year of kindergarten for him. So kind of the similar idea, preschool, kindergarten, whatever. And yeah, like they fully have iPads in school and they're not on them all the time, but these screen things are a fully a part of the kind of curriculum now where they have specific times where they're using them as part of the, the way that the school is. So there's no way to get rid of it. So What is the practical way that we manage the reality of all of these devices and all of the Wi-Fi and all of that stuff? Like, how do we make it work for the busy moms that don't have the ability to make kind of drastic measures? The first thing is to ask questions, which is exactly what you're doing, and to keep the question alive and to keep the discussion alive. And I'm going to say again, I salute you for asking that question. And it doesn't feel good to be here especially if you've got children and you are wanting to give them the safest environment that you can. And yes, most schools are now handing out iPads in nursery schools and in kindergartens. It's not how I would have it. And I recognize that it is happening. To go back to your question, what can you do? Cleaning up the bedroom is one of the most important things you can do. So while you're sleeping, If you're trying to conceive, if you are pregnant, you want a really safe bedroom. So if you have one of those $10 digital clocks that are often near people's bedsides, I would say go to the thrift store and get just a plain wind-up alarm clock. You don't want that near your head while you're sleeping. You don't want anything plugged in near your bed. So you don't want to be charging your phone near your bed while you're sleeping. You don't want the TV plugged in. You don't want it just off. You want it unplugged while you're sleeping. And I live in a really small house and our refrigerator and stove are on the other side of the wall from our bedroom wall. And the truth is I unplug that refrigerator every night before I go to sleep. And how I deal with that, I have, you know, those small juice bottles with like two cups of juice in them, those plastic things. I've just saved them and then I fill them with water and I keep them in the freezer. And then every night I put a few of those frozen bottles into the refrigerator with a few bottles on each shelf. And I haven't lost any food yet. I've been doing this for years. And that helps keep our bedroom cleaner electromagnetically. So that's a start. And then I would encourage if a woman is pregnant that if you can, and if you do have a child, if you can get a corded landline telephone, these are very hard to get now, but if you can, that would be better. And certainly if you have a mobile phone, just use it on speakerphone. You don't want it near your head. You don't want it in your bra or in your pants pocket we're all going to be figuring this stuff out. The answers are not going to be easy. Let me also recommend another website. It's called babysafeproject.org. That's babysafeproject.org. And that features Hugh Taylor, who's the head OBGYN at Yale Medical School. It's a very short video. And he says that pregnant women and children should not get near cell phones or Wi-Fi. So, It is very sobering. It really is. And you must be gentle with yourself. Listen to me talking and saying that word must. That's your most important job, to be gentle with yourself as you ask these questions. Well, and I feel like it would be easy to say that by me saying something like, that's not realistic, Katie. For example, to say that women, pregnant women shouldn't be around cell phones. And I could see an argument being made for, well, if something's important to you, then you just make it happen. 
And so I recognize that it is possible for us all to kind of take these drastic measures. But with that being said, this is the reality of the world that we're living in. And so I wonder what, if anything, and, can can be done if a person... Okay, so you're a parent, you have five kids already, some are younger, some are older, and then you hear this podcast and you think to yourself, well, pff, what am I supposed to do? I was pregnant with my baby five years ago. My son's now five. I had my cell phone with me the whole time. I always had it in my purse, which I carried right beside my belly. So what you're telling me is that I've done permanent damage to my baby, but you're not telling me like what I can do then now. So I mean, other than, of course, okay, wait, doing so the let me come in and say, I am with the reality that in many cases, you're not going to be able to quit the cell phone. I'm with you. I get that. I'm there. And when you say that you may have done permanent damage to your baby, I think we're going to need another way of naming that because I do perceive that this stuff is not good for anybody. I am on that page as well. I also perceive that anyone listening to this show would only be here because they want to be the best parent that they can be and they want the healthiest environments for their children as possible. I don't think anyone is intentionally doing this. And in case you didn't notice, this information that I'm giving is not being given out freely before you buy the cell phone, before you install the Wi-Fi. We have all been taking on these new technologies without asking questions like, wait a second, is this really okay? And then we've got these federal laws saying it's actually prohibitive. You know, it's a little more complicated than that, but federal laws are not supporting that we be cautious before we buy this stuff or install it. So there's a whole host of factors and we are all at the mercy of forces beyond our control here. Now, what is it that anyone can do at any stage in their being alive right now and, and having children or not having children or trying to get pregnant or whatever? And I'll say it again, you can make your bedrooms clean. So turn the Wi-Fi off for at least 12 hours while you sleep. Now, a lot of people have told me in that case, that means they're not going to have phone access for those 12 hours. And I would say that would be a sacrifice. You're going to have to decide what you can do. Maybe it means putting the router, if you have a big enough house, putting it far, far away from you. Maybe it means trying to get a corded landline telephone, which again is not possible in many areas. You can unplug things around the bed. See if after a couple of weeks, if you sleep better, if your digestion improves, you can try these things. It doesn't cost money to try them. You can use only the speakerphone if you have a, a mobile device. You can have your children watching television rather than playing video games and explain to them why you're doing that. Watch what Dr. Victoria Dunkley says on Reset Your Child's Brain. Get informed and Find things that will occupy your children so that you can make dinner. I mean, mothers have been doing that for a long time. And yes, I know once you've offered a video, which is really transfixing, your child may want more. But okay, let's try and find other things because that's been done for centuries. That other things have engaged children before videos. I think it's helpful. I think that it's a hard topic and it'll be interesting to see where things go in the future. I mean, I've heard different people kind of talk about different aspects of this. Like, for example, I've heard and I don't know exactly like, but this is just from information that I've heard here and there. But like, so say when you're when you're flying, of course, you're exposed to a ton of radiation just by being kind of up there in the atmosphere. And so I've heard people talk about different supplements they take to minimize oxidative stress and all this kind of stuff. It'll be interesting to find out then what's going to happen in this area within the coming years, because the question that I have regarding, so, I mean, if there's so much talk about the dangers, the, the fact that exposure to electromagnetic radiation, especially in utero and for young children, could be damaging to the brain. When I grew up, everyone didn't have a cell phone. So when I was a baby, there were no cell phones. Like, that was not a thing. They didn't exist. 
now then kids are growing. So any effects that we're going to see, uh, kind of similar to how we talk about the birth control pill on the show, but the effects of what's happening from long-term exposure throughout your entire childhood, that's what we're going to start to see now. And so it'll be interesting to see then how it's dealt with, because I feel like it's important to do the prevention thing. And that's, of course, what we need to focus on now. But prevention, it can help the children that are affected by it now. But if it's as bad as they say, and exposure to electromagnetic radiation can alter the brain and cause all these problems, then minimizing the exposure in and of itself may not be enough to fix it if it's as bad as they say. If you go to what's that website, babysafeproject.org, and you turn on that video and watch what the doctor has to say, by the end of the video, you kind of want to jump off a cliff. (laughs) <laughs> because it's just he's painting this picture that's just so awful and then you look down at your cell phone and then you think like well what am I supposed to do like it's you and me buddy like what <laughs> and I'm gonna let me so let me say it again whether you've already got a child who's having regular meltdowns or you're trying to get pregnant or whatever in every case turn the wi-fi off for at least 12 hours you can start there And we're all going to need skills in functioning without this stuff. Children need those skills. (laughs) And so you can explain that to your children and say, okay, it's really cool that we've got these tools. They are privileges. And we also want to know how to mash potatoes without an electronic masher or something like that. I'm just thinking, you know, that's not a great example. One of my favorite studies, it was done in the 70s. Maybe you've heard of it. There was a class of kindergartners at Stanford University in the 70s, and they put each child into a room for 15 minutes alone, and they would give the girl or boy a marshmallow, and they would say, you can have this marshmallow, but I've got to go somewhere for 15 minutes, and then I'm going to come back in, and hey, if you've still got the marshmallow here, I'll give you two. So you can have two marshmallows if you don't eat this one during the 15 minutes I'm gone. So in other words, they were testing, could this child delay gratification for 15 minutes? And the children who could, and they did so by, like, they would sing a song to themselves, they would take a nap, they would make up a story. Those children, they went back and observed this class of students, I think, 10 or 15 years later. And the children who were able to delay gratification for 15 minutes for another marshmallow, they were much stabler people. They had more skills. They were stronger academically. They were more socially flexible and adept than the kids who couldn't wait and who ate that marshmallow. So now we've electrified that marshmallow temptation, but we still need that skill in delaying gratification. So if mothers can introduce that possibility to their children and just say, hey, can we try waiting to eat this marshmallow or whatever it is for five minutes and then the next day trying for eight minutes or something like that? Like if we can, and what could we do during those five minutes or eight minutes while we wait to eat the marshmallow or whatever the thing is? That's another thing mothers can do. Well, and so as we gear towards the end of our interview today, you know, we've talked about a lot of things and we've covered some of the dangers and some of the ways that we can really minimize our exposure, which I think is really great. I think it's really great to give the listeners practical things that they can do. And the incredible thing about it is how big of an impact it can have. So uh, to kind of really focus on minimizing that exposure for a two, three week period and then going ahead and uh, reintroducing it. I feel like that's a really good and practical strategy. And it can also show you if electromagnetic exposure is impacting your children and also to what degree. I think that's really interesting. But after everything we've talked about today, what's one thing that you'd want the listeners to take from our conversation? Just that we're raising the question. That's really great. Just to say, wow, is this a factor in my life? And if it is, can I take one of these steps like not doing video games, watching TV, or turning the Wi-Fi off for at least 12 hours, or only using mobile devices on the speakerphone, like not having them against a body part? Just raising those questions and seeing 
if you have an inkling that this might be a factor in your family's health, is there something you can do to decrease your green time exposure or your exposure to radiation? Well, and for a woman who then is either pregnant now or thinking of pregnancy and concerned about EMF exposure, because as I mentioned, this is something that I do get questions about. So, I mean, women are concerned and I think it's like our spidey senses are going off. We know that there's something here, but we just don't know exactly what it is. So what would you want to tell to her specifically? Get informed. So the websites that I mentioned, resetyourchildsbrain.com, my essay, Calming Behavior in Children with Autism and ADHD, which is on my website, electroniksilentspring.com, my book, An Electronic Silent Spring. That's a good introduction to the overall topic. Also, zonein.ca, zone-in.ca has great stuff for families, and babysafeproject.org. And if you sign up at my website's newsletter, I have a monthly newsletter. When stuff comes to me, new stuff comes to me, I'm so happy to share it with people. But we got to start talking about this because it's not going away. And we need to know within the realities, what is doable. Well, and all of those websites that you mentioned, I'll link to on the show notes page. And I think that I, I like I said, I wonder what's going to happen in the future. And I feel like if enough parents and enough women and enough families start to ask questions, perhaps then the actual physical structure, the requirements, the kind of regulations around manufacturing uh, computers and cell phones, I imagine that they'll be a lot different in the future. I imagine that at some point, the problem is going to be more squarely identified <laughs> and quantified. Let me tell you what the direction that I would like for it to go in, and that would be for everything to be wired. The problems come with wireless. But that's, that's where the problems That would multiply. be going backwards. I would imagine that that's just not going to happen because you can't plug a cell phone in anywhere, right? Like that's the whole yeah, point. Yeah, no. So, <laughs> well, that's the, so what I'm saying is what's your preference? Mobility or having only a wired telephone and a wired TV screen? The problems with wireless are so enormous. I haven't really even touched on them. I'm a dreamer, though. I'm a philosopher is actually a better term. That sounds better, right? But I would wonder if there, in the future, if there would be a possibility for a third option where they clamp down on the wired devices and at least minimize somehow so that they're not emitting all the time or, but that's a conversation, I guess, a speculative conversation for another day. But I wonder if in the future, I mean, maybe the solution isn't more technology, right? Maybe the solution is less, but I hope that either way, a conversation will start so that we can start addressing these issues because it's just terrifying as, as a, a mom or as a, a woman who's planning to, to have babies to try to navigate these waters and to be really unsure as to how best to ensure that your baby has a, a healthy, safe environment, right? I don't know. There's just so many factors that challenge the health of our kids these days. So let me say again, I salute you, Lisa, for having this conversation. And my wish for you and for everyone listening is that you have at least one friend and your mate <laughs> who you can talk with about this stuff. I mean, I want everyone to have at least one talking partner because it's here <laughs> and it just really helps to have a friend that you can ask these crazy questions with and say, there's no way I'm going to give up my cell phone. And then at the same time, I'm realizing all the problems that come with it. We need friends who are going to say, okay, let's go through this slowly and see what is possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Asking the right questions can go a long way in finding solutions. Um, well, thank you so much, Katie, for being here today. Um, you did share your website information. And so we will link all of those in the show notes page, which you'll find over at fertilityfriday.com. So, you know, Katie, thank you so much for taking the time to come and share again with our audience a topic that a lot of listeners um, and a lot of women kind of wrestle with and trying to figure out how to protect our little ones. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here.
Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 162. That's fertilityfriday.com slash 162. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Katie Singer. It was a really interesting conversation and interesting because this topic impacts me on a personal level with two young children running around the house. The question of electromagnetic radiation and how it might impact their brains is obviously one that is near and dear to my heart. And often it's a challenging conversation for me to have because I often feel that my hands are tied. I often feel like, you know, what am I supposed to do? I don't want to become like that crazy hermit person that lives in the bushes and doesn't talk to anybody because they're so afraid of the electromagnetic radiation. I think it's really easy to take it kind of too far and to get really scared. And I mean, because we're surrounded. I mean, like I mentioned in the the episode, I have a cell phone and (laughs) I live in a big city and everyone else has a cell phone too. And I don't know anyone that doesn't have Wi-Fi. And it's easy to kind of get lost in that and really just feel helpless. Like there's there's nothing that that I can do. And I think that Katie's um, descriptions of things that we can do are really helpful to just think about minimizing the effects. But it leaves me with a lot of questions as well. It leaves me with a lot of questions as to what are the the impacts? How do we know how much exposure is too much? And how do we know how to draw that line? And so I really like the example that Katie gave with respect to doing electronic fast and then reintroducing electronics for short periods of time to get more of a sense of how it's impacting. I think that would be a really powerful exercise if you have the bandwidth to do something like that. And if you do decide to do that, I want to hear about it. So make sure to head over to the show notes page or jump into the Facebook group. So you'll find the private Facebook group that I host for Fertility Friday listeners at fertilityfriday.com slash community. Jump in there if you decide to actually do a kind of digital fast and let me know what the results are. Let me know if, if you see different behavior changes in your kids or if, if you notice it has a big impact on you because that's how we get this conversation going and that's how we start to figure out how exposure to this radiation is actually impacting us in a more practical way. For those of you who are ready to jump in and learn fertility awareness, for those of you who perhaps are completely new to this world and you're just wanting to make sure that you can feel confident in relying on the method for birth control, or for those of you who have been actively trying to conceive and you're wanting to gain some insight into what's happening in your cycles that could be preventing this from just happening spontaneously, I have a number of programs that will simultaneously guiding you through the process of charting your cycles and gaining that confidence using fertility awareness as a method of birth control and to accurately time sex, but also to really gain some deep insight into what your cycle says about your overall health. So for more information, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. That's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. So I just want to thank you again for listening to the show. There are thousands upon thousands of podcasts you could be listening to today, but you're listening to mine and I really appreciate it. And when I hear from you in emails and in the Facebook group, I know that you're taking me with you, whether you're commuting to work, um, some of you going for a jog or maybe you're at the gym working out. Some of you are doing housework and cleaning or even just taking a walk or, or doing something. I always think of something active, but you may also just be chilling out, listening. And some of you have told me that you've taken me along for road trips. So when you actually are going on a long road trip, kind of stacking the episodes and listening, binge listening to them. So however you're listening, I really appreciate you hanging out with me and spending the time uh, and supporting the show. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.